Well, as I told you, we're going to uh, spend some time at the end of the service. We've got a pretty good start here. Message isn't tremendously long, but I believe God has something to say to a lot of us in this room, all of us included, because there's things that we've faced on a daily basis, things that we have faced yesterday, things that we have faced in our childhood, situations at work, situations in our marriages uh, that have a tendency. As I was praying earlier in the service, I mentioned, you know, the, the lay aside the weights and uh, it's important that we understand that God has given us a spirit of power, right? Amen. You know, you won't frighten me with, by saying amen. I want to tell you, I was really encouraged. Last week I was uh, in the UP, up in Iron Country, that has been devastated over the years with the loss of the steel industry. And uh, interestingly enough, all the steel coming from China has literally decimated that part of the country. But it's coming back uh, but I was in a little town, I think they have 70 people. And the church, uh, if everybody's there relative to the COVID and stuff, they have right around 300 people in that little town. So they have made a great impact in that little region up there. Great worship, people coming to Christ, doing things outside the box. You know, so many people just come to church, get a message, and oh well, that's great, and I love the Lord, and you're probably going to heaven, but there's much more to it that God wants to raise us up but so many of us are weighted down. I want to, I'm using the, uh, and this has been a long time since I've used the Amplified Bible for my text. Uh, in fact, uh, Taylor who loads this stuff, Pastor Taylor who loads this stuff, didn't even have it in your platform here. To, so they got to, he had to take it off his phone to get the uh, Amplified Bible in there. But I want us to look at what will be probably the uh, key verse for our, our study today. And uh, it's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Let's put it up. Uh, why don't we read it together? So we, can we do that? I mean, can we just sort of read it? I think we can. Here it is. And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge or nursing anger and harboring resentment and cultivating bit, bit, uh, bitterness. And there's also goes on, and I want to stress this, that we do not... Let the devil get a foothold in our life. Are you ready? Not a foothold in our life. And I was thinking of, of things today. We're going to have a good prayer time at the end, and we're going, to, we're going to pray the footholds or whatever off of you guys. It was interesting. I was looking in, uh, for definitions, biblical definitions of what a foothold is. It says, uh, where the enemy takes a territory to launch attacks. And so let's say when the, when the devil has a foothold in your life, he's taking your territory, which should be yours in Christ, and he wants to launch attacks at you. Individuals in the body of Christ are under attack. I remember when we dealt with that attack by that group in 1998 at Bayside slash Celebration, and everybody, there were, some of our leaders were frightened because they were worried that they would take our, take our tax-exempt status from us. I just told them, look it. If we uh, lose our tax-exempt status, we will pay taxes and we'll keep kicking the devil around. Amen? Uh, fear. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But, and I have Tom Truckee here. Tom is an ordained uh, minister in Grace International. He has a unique, very unique ministry. I think probably there's not another man who's ordained in America that has the kind of ministry he has. He uh, has been given liberty by the bishop here in Green Bay, the Catholic bishop. He moves through Catholic gatherings, uh, Spanish, English. He works uh, in deliverance with a priest. I think he had to lead the priest to the Lord before they could do deliverances together. But he has a unique ministry in touching hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of Catholics with this message of accepting Jesus. And then over the years, Tom and I have been friends. And this is something that I felt, I called him last night when I was just working on, on this message and thinking about it. I said, Tom, would you come today? Because at the end of this service today, there are people in this room that have been carrying around stuff for years, maybe 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, whatever, that need to be set free. So we want to, you know, the church should actually be a Petri dish. You know what a Petri dish is? It's what they do in biology class, and they get stuff to happen with, a, with bugs and all that other junk uh, to experiment. You know, really, the church should be a place where you can come and be set free. 
But we backed off in all of those areas. We don't want to offend someone that doesn't understand that. We, we, we want to just pull back. And boy, the enemy just claps at that. Now, I understand being fearful and losing people and all that other stuff. But the reality is, I, I go back to this, and I'll just paraphrase it. When Jesus' ministry and life was, was really toward the end of ministry and his messages were more and more pointed, the disciples came to him one day and said, hey, Lord, people are leaving us. What did, did Jesus say? Oh, boy, I better back off, take it easy so we keep our crowds. No, he said, are you going to go too? See, he wasn't going to back off. Now, I will tell you this. This is not a message that's going to drive people away today. It's a, it's a message that's going to drive hungry people to us. Amen? Amen? So how do we illustrate this? I was thinking about it yesterday. And yesterday morning, I had breakfast with uh, Jason and uh, Robert Grosarek and a couple other, uh, and me and another guy. Uh, it was a glorious breakfast, by the way. We gambled. Yeah. Here's what we do. The four of us, I had the waitress bring us each a dollar bill. And then whoever had the best poker hand didn't have, so the one who had the worst poker hand had to pay. So it was sort of fun. And the guy, the guy that Bob Grisarek invited, the poor guy, got the low number and had to buy breakfast. But we had a great time. And I was telling Jason about some way I want to illustrate this thing of a foothold. So I would like uh, Jason and Daniel, Daniel uh, is such a good friend of mine, come up here. We've got to stand here so they can see it for those that are online. Come on up here. Taylor, we just stay right in this aim. For those of you that are watching, I hope you see this. Uh, Daniel has traveled with me a few times when I preached out. He's my bodyguard. <laughs> so anybody that gets mad at me, I say, you go through him first. 6'4", yeah, okay. probably 260, and about 200 that has muscles. So, uh, but what I want you to do is just move over here a little bit, and I want you to grab Get down on your knees and grab his, his ankle. Just hang on to it. You can hang on to his shoe. You don't have to touch. He's got a hairy leg there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Now, here, I, I, here's the deal. I want you to hold it because I'm going to ask Jason to try to get away. Go, go, go ahead. Hold it. Maybe <laughs> both hands, strong man. Right. Try to get away. Okay, that, the point is, just stay here a minute. Now, keep holding him for a second. Basically, if I wanted to do anything to him, I could easily do it because he can't run away. He can't get away. He can't break the hold. And I wanted you to just see many of you. You guys can go down now. Thanks. Many of you. Did you get it? I wanted you to realize that the enemy gets a hold of us in some area of our life. And I want to talk about those areas today. And uh, <clears throat> I was... Uh, I want, to, I want to put up a portion of scripture also from the Amplified Bible to Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48. Now, I'm going to read them to you, but most of you know the story. This is a lady who had been sick for years, uh, serious female problems. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you get to your wit's end, how many have ever been to your wit's end? I was talking to Jeannie a few weeks ago, and the, the Pesheks, Gary and Jeannie, have been my friends for years, and I was privileged to be their pastor for a long time. She was going through some serious pain. And through uh, some things that really worked for her, she miraculously was set free. But when I talked to her on the phone, it was sciatic nerve, is that what it was? She said, man, this has been so bad for three weeks, I don't know if I want to live. Now, she was at her wit's end physically. People get at their wit's end financially sometimes. People get at their wit's end over uh, situations in work or in your marriage or all kinds of stuff. So I think as we look at this woman, she was desperate. And if you're going to get relief and victory over that thing that's pressing you, that thing that's, that's holding you, and you just seem, you maybe know what the right move is, but you just can't move. See, what the devil has done, according to this other illustration I used on foothold, he's got you held in his territory, and he's launching attack after attack at you, and it wears you down, and maybe in your mind you know what to do, but the enemy has been firing these things at you, firing them at you, and you're at your wit's end. Now, maybe you don't want to admit it. Maybe you wouldn't tell anybody but so many people carry those things, and it grabs them and holds them. So let's just look at what this woman did. 
And many of you know this story, so put it up, would you, Taylor? Passage in Luke. And a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and had spent all of her money on physicians and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his outer robe and immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus said, who touched me? While they were dying, denying it, Peter and those who were with him, see the big crowd, said, Master, the people are crowding and pushing against you. Jesus said, someone did touch me because I was aware that the power to heal had gone out of me. Let's just stop right there. You see, when you get desperate enough and you said, I've had enough of this attack on my life, I've had enough of this attack on my finances. I've had enough of this attack on my family. I've had enough of this attack in my life. I want to press in. And I'm going to push in there. And she couldn't even get close enough. She reached out and just touched the hem of his garment. And boom, the healing virtue of Jesus came into her. Now, if she, you think if she had sat home and talked about it and said, I can't pay the bills anymore. The doctors have taken all of my money. I'm weak from losing all this blood. I've been, I've been everywhere to try to get fixed. No! She had to get up and press in and just reach out. And, that, and today, at the end of the service, we're going to give you an opportunity not just to sit where you are, but to come up here, press in, and we're going to pray for you, and we're going to believe God to get rid of some of the stuff that has a hold on you, that has a hold on your territory. Now, I don't want to give the devil any authority, but he is a strong man. Now, I'm not calling you the devil, Daniel, but uh, he is a strong man. And, and you know, uh, uh, Jason and I have been friends for years. I didn't have the privilege to pastor him at celebration. He came in at our base at after I left, but we've become great friends. And I've walked through some things that he had to press through that were very difficult. Would you agree? And, and by pressing through in, in one of the areas specifically, he's seeing great victory. But you've got to press in, right? Say press in. Say press in. Now, if I was in an African-American church today, man, they'd be pressing, they'd be shouting me down. All right, let's look at these things that we have to press in to get the victory over, all right? A desperate, weak woman presses in. Doesn't have to be a woman to be desperate. Sometimes women are much better at expressing their need than men. Would you agree? We're, we're tough, we're strong. Doesn't matter. That's it. you got to push through all of that stuff. So some of the things that uh, I, I looked at, and the number one thing I want to talk to you a few minutes about is fear. 1 Timothy 1.7. Can we pop it up? Amplified. Wanting to be teachers of the law of Moses, even though they did not understand the terms. Uh, that's Luke 1.7. We want uh, 1 Timothy 1.7. We don't have to, you don't have to put it up. It's, but... What it talks about is we, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Say that with me. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, I'm sure you're brilliant enough. Let me, let me just tell you, when I was in, in grade school, they did an uh, a IQ test. And I walked by the teacher's desk, and I saw my name on a piece of paper, and it said 87. Now, my first assumption was I got an 87 IQ. That's pretty low, right? A number of years later, I told a story, and my dear friend Perry Shaw in Salt Lake City, Utah, an educator, brilliant guy, and I was telling the story. It was a different test that I looked at. It wasn't my IQ, but for a while I thought that. He said, well, Arnie, at least 87 is educable. So they can educate you even if you have that low of an IQ. But now the point is this. Let me just talk to you a minute. God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? Then you brilliant people tell me, who do you think gave you that spirit of fear? Can I get it? Duh. Maybe you're in that 87 level too. I don't know. If God didn't give us the spirit of fear, who gave it to us? The devil. He wants us fearful. He wants us locked up in fear and, and every movement. Right? I still like you, even though you didn't. You should. All right. Fear. I have a good friend in Dixon, Illinois, Pastor Don Beasley. He's, one of the, he's so smart. I mean, uh, his IQ is about twice mine. But he's understandable. He's lovely. I talk to him once or twice a week. And when he rings, I say, Jan, I'm getting the Beasley report. And he's into every nuance, not only of the political agenda, but biblical and all this stuff. 
And I just loved listening to him. And he said he was reading this article that he came across. He said this, if you can get people as a whole, as a group, to fear for six months, they will do anything you ask them to do. Think about that a minute. What do you think is going on in America? You know, I, I get tired, very tired. I shared a message, what's wrong with the new normal a while back. I was going to preach it today, but the Lord directed me in this direction. But I, 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 I hate words like percentages and curve and COVID and all of these things. It was interesting to me, too, that the CDC came out a while ago saying that I think it's only 6% of people that die from the COVID actually die from the COVID, right? It's true. Now, there was a tragic loss of a, a teacher at the high school at Bayport. Many of you read and saw that, didn't you? COVID. Do you know she had a liver transplant four months ago? Do you know that she was a type 1 diabetic? Now, that is going to come out. But right away, oh, man, the teachers are getting it and they're dying. Now, I'm not diminishing the fact that she died or other teachers who maybe legitimately did. But see, they got us living in fear. I mean, you know, just stay away from me. I was walking my dogs the other day and talked to some elderly neighbors. We, we don't live in a 55-plus neighborhood, but most of them are old. <laughs> er. <laughs> and I'm walking by and we're talking. My dog was barking at her and she said, don't get any closer. Don't get any closer. Like, you know, like I was carrying something. And then it's ironic. You go to the restaurants, right? Oh, boy, you got your mask on. You sit down. And then you take your mask off. And, and automatically, all of the germs in your life just hover over the table. They don't slip next to you. They don't go across the aisle. But people are frightened. And I'm not, you know, I'm just telling you, that's where the enemy moves in our life. Fearful. And I have to be careful that I, I, I don't get fearful that the other side of the aisle might win the election. And if we do, we might come under persecution, but the Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, and maybe we have to stand up and be strong against forces that are out to get us, right? I'm not buying into that. I don't want it, but I want to be strong enough that it happens, and I want fear to paralyze me. And that's what's going on in the news media. Man, it's, you know, I don't watch it much. Well, I watch it more than much. Jan just refuses. She's on a diet from that stuff. Because if you're not careful, it can get catch on to you. And, oh, man, we're in trouble here. Fear. Six months. Also, Don told me this a while back. He, when we had, what were we uh, quarantined for? Was it 40 days? Isn't that what it was? He said, as you study in the Hebrew, about a 40-day set apart and be alone, after that you start going crazy. After you're in more than 40 days. You see, all of this is a unique attack of the enemy to raise the fear level and get people... And see, can you imagine, if you go back and study history, there were a lot of good people in Germany that after all of the fear that Hitler kept putting on them and the Blitzkrieg and all that other stuff, eventually they fell in line. They fell in line when they were taking hundreds of thousands of Jewish people to incinerate them at the various points Many of you have heard me say this before, but I was greatly impacted on many of these issues in 1982 at a prayer breakfast for the Assemblies of God in Anaheim, California. James Watt, who was the Secretary of Interior under Reagan, gave a speech. He was there to dedicate memorial to the Holocaust. And so we were able to get him to speak at our prayer breakfast. And he said when he was there to dedicate the building, and this is, this is relevant to where we are today, the octagonal building on each of the eight walls that they walked around, there were pictures depic depicting the horrors of the Holocaust. And he said the one that caught his attention most where they had superimposed the various incinerating places that the Jews were sent to and superimposed behind the pictures of those places were the steeples of the church of Germany, churches. And what it said this, here was the inscription right in this thing, they had eyes to see but they did not see, they had mouths to speak but they did not speak, and they had ears to hear, but they did not hear. A lot of church people today, we don't have to go outside the church and castigate those who don't go. It's right here. What is it, 40% of evangelicals didn't vote in the last election? Was that what, something like that? Wasn't Kelly, I'm not sure, but it's right up there. I mean, I'm telling you what, that's bad. And all of that revolves around oh, fear. Now they're going to be people that are afraid to go to vote because someone might cough on them. 
wear a mask, do whatever. I, you know, I'm sure if someone's censoring this today, I'm going to be on someone's list. But you know what? I don't care. I mean, I'm 74. They can get me tomorrow. I've had a good life. God has not given me a spirit of fear but a power. So we're going to pray against fear today. And that might be something all of us need, right? Because if I allow myself, I get, I get a little nervous about all the stuff that's going on. I've, I've been in a wonderful country, lived my life from 1946, the day I was born to now, and it, by and large, been pretty doggone good. Right? But I worry about my grandchildren. I worry about your kids. I worry about people that are in their 30s and 40s. You know, I'm in that age now where they say you look good for your age. <laughs> Maybe they're lying. I don't know. But here, here's another thing that grips us, and I could list so many things. The past. Many are gripped by their past, and it cripples you. I wrote a book, The High Cross of Resentment. Some of you might have let, read it. Resentment is one of the things that really cripples us. I was preaching in Fresno, California uh, at my former assistant's church, Dale Oquist, and I preached on the subject of resentment in the altars, and the church runs thousands of people, and they were at the altar. They're just all over the place. And after the service, I was at, there were so many people there, they had four or five book tables. And I stood by one of the book tables, and a, a middle-aged middle, middle -aged lady came up to me and said, uh, I'm ahead of some department at the, uh, the, the university, Fresno State, and she said, we've been studying resentment and bitterness. And she said, we have found that is the key, one of the key, if not the key cause of depression, suicide, and all of these things. And she said, something happens in a person's life, maybe as a kid, maybe as a teenager, maybe as an adult, and they carry that thing and they hold on to it and it breaks them. It grips them. I remember a pastor explaining he had just been found out that he was in an adulterous relationship. And he left his church in Des Moines, Iowa to drive to where the district office was where they were going to strip him of his credentials. I'll never forget his words when he said, the icy cold fingers of fear gripped me as I went to face my accusers. One of the first services that we had at Celebration at Lombardi, or Bayside at Lombardi Middle School, I had him come to preach. And he talked about how that overcame him. And some of the stuff that cripples you, you maybe did. Maybe you're guilty as guilty can be. And maybe you've never confessed it, or maybe you've tried to talk your way around it. But we are just in its, in its hold, and we need to reach out and push and, and, and touch him and push to the point where we're going to be set free. They used to call me the Teflon pastor. My staff did. I mean, and I was in some self-related things that I created because of certain ways I approached things in the church, which I think were right, but, you know, that's always it. And I, uh, I, I, had a, I could just walk right through that stuff. I could come out of a meeting that was terrible on a Wednesday night with some leaders, walk into a Wednesday night service, no one knew that I was getting hammered and all this kind of stuff. But then a situation happened after I left celebration at Bayside, and bitterness and anger and resentment got me. I'll never forget, I was sitting in our family room in our house in Salt Lake City, and Jan said to me, I'll never forget, she said, I want the old Arnie back, the optimistic. We can do anything. doesn't matter what got us here. God's going to get us through. And she was right. God has gotten us through. We're living a good life. Maybe we don't have the final financial resources we had at one time or for people our age, but you know what? God is our source, right? But situations grip you, and, and that situation scraped all the Teflon off my pan. And until I made it right, until I owned the whole situation and said, you know what, the people or the person or whatever, how it abused me, I mean, if that's a, an ab abuser in your life, that's someone that hurt you as a kid, someone that raped you as a kid, some, some uh, religious figure, some parent, some situation, you know what, you can't go back. The Bible says this one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind instead of running them over and over in our mind and replaying the situation, and I'm in tough shape. Poor me. And I went through that for my scenario. And I want to tell you what, it just robs you. You're drinking the poison that you wish that that situation had been drowned with or that you could have had a better life and a better situation. And then it spills over on those around you. That's why Jan said, I want the old Arnie back. The optimistic, we can do anything. We can reach a city. We moved here and there was very small evangelical churches and we were able to see God break through and see thousands of people come to Christ. But see, some small thing. You know, your car doesn't have to be out of much of alignment if you take the hands off the wheel for hit the ditch. we got to keep an alignment. Can I get an amen from the congregation? I'm just about done. Third thing is addictions. Drugs. Hopefully that's not your problem. Alcohol. Alcohol is dangerous. It is. Sex addiction. Not like the woman at the well. I mean, she could have got on Dr. Phil. Married five or six times and she's living with a guy. And Jesus said, I got water you can drink that'll set you free. Kicked off a revival there in That Samaritan woman, a bunch of them got saved. Computer. Think about it a minute. There's nothing wrong with a computer. It's a marvelous tool, even though I'm not very good at it. Pastor Jerry helps me. My son helps me. Colin helps me. Gosh. I got, you know, I I was trying to track a package that's supposed to come, and I couldn't figure it out. And Chad was over last night, hand the phone. He said, oh, here's the deal, Dad. Boom, 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 you know. So you you don't worry about me getting addicted to the computer because I don't even know how to drink it. (laughs) But you know what? We got kids today. You know, when we were kids, now, I know I'm I'm an old guy, but you know what we did when we were kids? We played baseball. We played football. We played tag. We played hide-and-go-seek. We got in the house, and we watched the Lone Ranger and and, and, uh, Sky King and uh, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and... They couldn't even say pregnant on TV back then. Do you know that? That's true. Back in the early 50s, they couldn't say pregnant on TV. Now they show you how to do it. Hello? Your kids are seeing stuff that wasn't even in the bad magazines, and they're seeing it in commercials on TV. We can help you with your problems. i got to be careful because I might say something that, well, I've done that before too, and I've gotten in trouble for it. But the point is, what's got you? Are you taking a stand? Or are you caving? Come on. Are you taking a stand or are you caving? Are you giving in to fear? Are you gripped by your past and your mistakes? Has an addiction came into your life that's robbing you of time and energy? Not that, not that everybody has to play baseball and football and basketball and kick the can. Does anybody know what kick the can is? Oh, there's a few of you oldies. Do you know, Chad? That's good. Well, what are we going to do about it? I want to close with this scripture, and then we're going to pray. For those of you that are watching us online today, you're going to miss this part. So if you're getting better and you're feeling like you can take a chance, come to church. Because you miss even that, the, the fellowship coming together, right? But if you're fearful, that's your thing, and God bless you. I want us to look at Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 5. I read this this morning on my reading the Bible through. If, if, if you don't do that, there's a great book by my friend Larry Stocksdale from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Larry's a great guy, loves God. And he wrote this thing that goes along with every day. You read it first and it gives you the scriptures. And it'll speak to your heart every day. It'll minister to you every day. But I read through this scripture today and I want to share it with you in the Amplified. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. But in fact, say fact. You know what a fact is? A fact. And that's the way it is, baby. A fact. He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows and our pains. Now, this is Isaiah talking about prophetically what's going to happen in the future. This is talking about Jesus. For those of you who don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to tell you this whole thing comes together. Right? Let me just throw this in. And i got to just throw this in. I was watching this, this program. And they're trying to catch uh, cold cases. So if they can just get a little bit of DNA, 
even if it's not the person who committed the crime, they can find out a family member, search the family members out, zero them out, and find the second or third cousin. And, 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 and t- Now, you want to tell me, is that an accident? Who, someone created that? Come on, Bill Gates. That's bigger than you. Are you with me? This is the God we serve. Put it back up again. In fact, he has borne our griefs, he's carried our sorrows and pains, yet ignorantly, but ignorantly assumed that he was stricken, struck down by God, and degraded and humiliated on the cross. By him, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our wickedness. And a lot of us had wickedness to be crushed. One of my friends, right after I got saved, I picked him up, Dick Nelson. And I told him I was going to the kind of church that, I, that this church is and that I was attending. And I said, I don't, I don't go out in crowds and drink anymore. And he said, oh, Arnie, that church has brainwashed you. I said, yep, Dick, I had a dirty old brain, needed a good old washing. I had sin. I was being crushed by it. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. And by his stripes, wounds, we are healed. Thank you for tuning in today and watching this. We're going to go to our altar time. God bless you. Would you stand with me, please? Here's what we're going to do. Tom, come on up.